folks. Uh, my name is Christy Bolton, and I am an actress, improver, and writer living in Hamilton, Ontario. And when Camille was talking to me about this project, it actually sparked something in me uh, because it was this wonderful way to sort of force me to uh, keep going with this project that I've been working on for a long time that has uh, actually only started to bloom because of the isolation we've had to experience with COVID. So uh, a little bit of history is that a number of years ago, uh, when I was about 27, I saw my first ever one woman show and it was by the incredible Colette Kendall, who is another theater or person here in Hamilton who runs the Staircase Theater, very near and dear to my heart. And I went and saw her production of The Cock Whisperer at a fr fringe show. And I was blown away. Here was this woman laying at bare, being so vulnerable and so funny, just telling her own personal stories through this incredible narrative and I left so inspired and just so ready to, you know, sink my teeth into telling some of my own stories in hopes that they might, you know, reach somebody in the same way hers had reached mine. And I told myself I would do it by the time I was 30. So at the time I was 27 and the next few years I went and saw and exposed myself to a number of other one woman shows. And there are some incredible artists in the Hamilton, Toronto area, but at 27 came and then 28 came. And then 29 came, and then 30 came, and then it was two weeks before my 31st birthday, and I still had not written the show that I had set out to write all those years ago. And it wasn't like I hadn't tried, you know, I had like sat down and so many times I had, you know, done the very stereotypical writing thing. I'd gone, taken a notebook and gone to a coffee shop and, you know, furiously written out an outline or come up with 16 different titles that might work to inspire um, I'd written down all of the bits of stories that I wanted to tell and how they might align together. I had skeleton scripts um, on, you know, seven or eight different Word documents on my computer. And no matter what I did, I really struggled to actually get my own stories on paper and have them have any semblance of a narrative. And I was getting so frustrated because... Even in these, these two weeks leading up to my 31st birthday, I felt like such a failure because I'd set this, this timeline for myself that I was going to get done, and I didn't do it. My birthday was on March 16th, and that was the first day that they'd started announcing closing down things. Uh, it was a Friday, and um, I was supposed to go out with a bunch of friends to a bar, and it was the first thing that I canceled because of COVID. And... Over the next few weeks, I found myself getting more and more frustrated with the isolation like we all are, and I couldn't create, I, I couldn't make myself do anything. The one thing I was doing was my improvised podcast, but what's nice about improv is that it's very free, it's very flowy, and um, being a podcast, we could already get stuff done. But I, I couldn't write, I couldn't do anything. I felt very, you know, strangled by everything. And then one day I had to do laundry and laundry is like my least favorite thing to do in the world. And so I sat down and I started just like furiously writing about how I didn't want to do laundry. I don't know what really pushed me to do it. I was just so frustrated. And all of a sudden I realized I was writing a monologue, but it wasn't a monologue from my perspective. It was from the perspective of a girl named Ruby. And all of a sudden I just kept writing writing and writing and I realized that I was writing my story but that it was easier to write from this girl's perspective because it wasn't so close it wasn't so tenuous it wasn't you know cutting me in the way that sometimes personal stories do when you have to relive them and even though I was telling my stories through this this kind of lens it didn't feel as scary and I could empathize with her and then Camille reached out to talk about this project, and I realized that when you are in a laundromat, you are absolutely in isolation, you know, uh, unless you're there with a partner or a friend, you are sort of in this space where you have to supply your own entertainment that you can't leave, and you're stuck in the waiting place, very much like the Dr. Seuss part uh, book, um, Oh, the Places You'll Go. And so I sort of forced myself to write. And that is what you'll be hearing today. Uh, it is an excerpt from, like I said, my play called Laundry Day. And I hope that you enjoy it. 
So thank you so much, and here it is. I present to you an excerpt from my new one-woman show, Laundry Day, by me, Christy Bolton. Ruby walks into the laundromat with a backpack full of disheveled-looking clothes. She looks disheveled as well, wearing stained sweatpants and an old hoodie from her university days. A hat sits lazily on her head, also clearly indicating that it is laundry day. We see her move to the middle of a row of three washing machines. She fishes in her pockets and finds the change she needs, placing it on top of the washer before taking her clothes and putting them in. All of her clothes are white, but we should see her put a red sock in by mistake. She starts talking as she continues to put the clothes in. I hate laundry day. I really do. It is the most annoying part of my week, and I will push it off as long as I possibly can. I will push it back until I am wearing my absolute last back of the drawer chock full of holes and regret pair of underwear. The kind of underwear you don't let anyone see because it's a little bit shameful that you still have them, let alone wear them. <laughs> yeah, I'll even let myself get down to that pair of underwear if it means putting off laundry one more day. It's just, it just feels like such a waste of a day, you know? Like I have to lug all of my stained, gross, sweaty clothes to this public place for the world to see and then load them into a machine that has been used by God knows who and then spend three to four hours here muddling away the time, not getting anything done, uncomfortable on these cold metal chairs which were clearly designed by a masochist, wishing I was home doing, I don't know, something, anything but this. It just feels like such a waste. I just, I just, I hate it. I hate laundry day. Especially now. Especially since I no longer have access to my own units. Especially since I have been spoiled by the delights of an ensuite washer and dryer for the last four years. Especially since it wasn't my choice to move out. And especially since... Honestly... Honestly, that's what I'll miss most from my old apartment, I think. The laundry machines. Sure, it had a fantastic kitchen, a huge bedroom with lots of sunlight, tons of closet space, and a remarkably deep clawfoot tub. But it's definitely the laundry machines I'll miss most. It's just, the thing is, I, I didn't always hate laundry. I actually used to kind of enjoy it. There's something so satisfying about the process, you know? Something about taking your dirty clothes, all jumbled up and wrinkled, smelling like the week you've had, sometimes spicy and hot, sometimes sad and desperate, sometimes stained with mustard and regret. <laughs> but then you throw them into the machine, and you pull out the detergent, all clean smelling and bright, pour it into the slot, turn the knobs to just the perfect settings, really the only settings you use because let's be honest you don't actually know what the other settings do and then knowing that in an hour you'll be back here ready to move on to the next cycle it's predictable it it's routine it's calm and you can get a lot done in an hour it was always my time for other chores too i'd get dishes done i'd sweep the floor i'd dust sometimes i would nap most of the time i would nap just napping between loads was so satisfying because you'd wake up to that fresh laundry smell just starting to permeate the house. You'd hear the beep and know it was time to continue the routine. You'd be back to the machines, now taking your clothes and popping them into the dryer, knowing that soon they would be all warm and cozy. And then another hour passes where you can do all kinds of things. You could nap some more. You could cook a meal. You could fly a kite. You could have sex. Oh, heck, you could have sex multiple times if you're lucky. Lots of hot, dirty, sweaty sex that you know is fine because there's still time for another load for the sheets. <laughs> oh, right. And then, again, beep, <laughs> it's time. I always took off whatever crap pants I was wearing and then immediately threw on a fresh, warm pair. It was like a hug for my legs. Oh, Plus the socks. Oh, you have to put on socks. The way they make your feet feel when they're all toasty like that. Oh, it's almost as good as the sex you just had. Sometimes it's better. <laughs> and then next, you carefully, lovingly pull out the rest of your clothes, 
once again fresh and clean, washed free of all of the past week's drama, battle scars of spills and dirt erased, almost like new, ready and willing for a new experience for new stains. Yeah, I used to like doing laundry. Now, well, now it's weird if I strip down and put on new pants in public, or so said that lady last weekend. And now there are no naps, because like I stated prior, these chairs are not meant for human comfort. Instead, they make your ass go numb after two minutes, because um, not only are they hard, no, no, they're also cold. And unlike your warm socks and pants, they do not feel like a hug. No, they offer the opposite of a hug. They are unhugs, frigid, calculated metal pieces of shit whose sole purpose is to remind you not to get too comfortable and that you are definitely not at home. Oh, and count sex out, because it gets creepy real fast when you are in a public laundromat where the only places to get freaky are the washroom covered in cobwebs and stains, whose origins I do not need to know, or the dark corner where the machines used to meet, but the corner units have been out for repair for so long now that now there's this creepy, dirty little empty nook at the wall where the light flickers and you occasionally see a mask by. Like a horror movie. It's real romantic. Yeah. Oh, right. And I now have to pay for the privilege to do my laundry in this fancy establishment. I mean, like, actively pay for it. When I had my own machines, like, I, I, I knew I was paying for it with Hydro or whatever. But it didn't feel like I was actively losing money, you know? Now, whenever laundry day is coming, I have to anxiously search the apartment on a veritable manhunt for change. I am like Jacques Cousteau, diving deep into the abyss of a sea of cushions, dust, crumbs, and knotted hair on a never-ending quest for that last necessary quarter. Because it can't be any change. Oh, no, no. It must be exact change. You find a nickel or a dime, you're wasting your time. No, instead, it needs to be one loony and three quarters for each machine. Each machine. And seriously, who just has 325 and change lying around? I don't know about you, but I just don't carry cash around much anymore. And laundromats are like the last relics of change-only options out there. Like, get with the times, laundromat! Where's my tap option? Join us in the 20th century! I mean, why can't this just be simple? Why is everything so difficult? And then you wait. You just, you just wait. Because what else can you do? You can't leave this place. You're bound to it like a prisoner, trapped at the mercy of the machines. And sometimes they're on time, but sometimes they're slow. Sometimes you forget to press start for half an hour, and then you are trapped in the void longer because no one has, there's no one to blame but yourself and your own stupidity. But regardless... Now you are here. Now you wait. And with waiting comes thinking. And with thinking comes, well, thoughts. Thoughts you might not want to have. Thoughts that choke you and drown you like the clothes tumbling behind you, turning around and around and around in your head in an unintelligible rhythm. No pattern, no order, just chaos. Memories tumbling aimlessly with no direction and nowhere to go, but around and around and around and around again. And it's not like you can escape those thoughts when all you have is time. You're stuck on the tumble cycle, at its mercy until it's done with you. I tried reading, you know? Yeah, I mean, it worked for a while, but now I find that I can't focus much. Especially on these damn seats. And every story is just too similar, you know? Everything is about love and connection. It's either about trying to find true love, <laughs> fighting for the love you have, searching for the love you don't, trying to cope with the love you've lost, or murder. A lot of the time there's a murder. Or dead parents. That happens a lot too. And honestly, I, I just had enough of those plot lines in my life for the time being. Thank you very much. It's just, I started young, you know? <laughs> so I've become pretty familiar with love and heartache. The first time I ever fell in love was when I was in kindergarten. 
I was an early love bloomer. <laughs> and it was with a boy. His name was Carson. He was in my AM class, and uh, I thought he was the whole world. He had this curly mop of brown hair and freckles for days, and two huge adult teeth that had come in way earlier than the rest and made him have a lisp. He also always had his finger in his nose, like digging for gold, but that didn't bother me. My dad always said there are two types of people in the world, people who pick their nose and people who lie about it, which meant Carson must have been the most honest boy in the world. And to me, he was perfect. <laughs> Every recess, we used to play wrestle on this big soccer field at the back of the school. Well, I don't know if you'd actually call it a soccer field. It was more of a mud pit disguised as one, with end posts on either side, ma masking it as a viable option for various sports. I mean, when you have 400 kids constantly running over it three or four times a day, it doesn't really leave much room for grass to grow. I'd always come home from school covered in fresh dirt stains, and my mom would huff about how she wished that I could find a less messy alternative to playing. Then she'd strip me down, put me in the bath, and whisk my clothes off to the basement laundry room. Mom always did the laundry. I have these great memories of her sitting in the basement with us kids watching Disney movies and constantly folding these ever-expanding piles of clothes. The three of us would be allocated to the big couch, while Mom would sit in the middle of the room on the smaller of the two, folding and folding. It seemed like this unending task to me, something that was never done and always in motion. She never really complained about it, though. In fact, I remember her once saying that, you know, it kind of helped her forget her worries that she could sort of get lost in the motion of it. It was something she could count on, that she planned out in her day. Sometimes I'd sit at her feet while she did it, trying to help. She'd show me how to fold the corners of a shirt just right so they lined up in the middle, and then would fold into a smaller square. I could never really get it right. Honestly, I still can't to this day. <laughs> they always look a little bit weird and uneven when I'm done. But she'd always humor me. A few times I caught her refolding my work, but it didn't really matter. It wasn't about the clothes. It was about spending time with her. And time with my mom was something I treasured. I didn't know how limited it was. Uh, anyway, so um, this, this one day, Carson and I were, you know, out and about doing our thing on the playground. When he turned to me and he told me he had a present. And so I closed my eyes, and I put out my hands, and I felt him push something into them. And when I opened my eyes again, I saw a gold ring with a ruby encrusted in it. It was one of the most beautiful things I had ever seen. He said it was a ruby for a ruby. And he got down on one knee and asked me to marry him. <laughs> my first proposal! <laughs> I asked him why he wanted to get married, and he responded with, that's what you do when you love someone. Because that's what you do when you love someone. I, I mean, my mom and dad couldn't argue with that logic, right? At least they couldn't think of anything to say to fight it when I rushed home and told them I was engaged. <laughs> I have this brief memory of my mom laughing about it. I, I think. It's fuzzy, but I think she laughed. She had a great laugh. Unfortunately... No one was laughing the next day when I came home covered in blood. Uh, sorry, that's a, that's a weird segue. It sounds murdery. I didn't kill anybody, regardless of the books I read. Though I did want to kill Carson. And it was his blood on my shirt. See, I went back to school the next day wearing my new shiny ring, fully prepared to start planning the wedding. Also, side note... I know that it was definitely a cereal box find, okay? I, I know it was one of those prizes that, you know, we found in cereal before corporations got cheap and started writing codes on the inside of the boxes. Oh, God, do you remember when it was, like, actual stuff? Like, the, the tiny little plastic renditions of your favorite cartoon characters? Total choking hazard, but so worth it. Oh, oh, and remember when it was CD games? They were, like, they were, like, legit games. It was Monopoly, Clue, Freddy Fish. It was a simpler time. But if I'm being honest, uh, it, it did take me a little longer than I care to admit to recognize that it was a cereal box ring. Like a few years, maybe. I mean, I, I deep down, I think I knew it wasn't real. But it didn't make it less special. 
and I walked to school with a proverbial feather in my cap ready to start planning my big day. I even brought bridal magazines I had found in the back of my family's church, so I was serious. I had to wait till recess to talk to Carson because, well, school. <laughs> it was a very busy morning of singing and finger painting. But when the bell rang, I ran to meet him at our usual spot, magazines in hand, excited to start our life together. And that's when I saw them, coming out of the big blue doors that led out of the school. He was with another girl. I, I think her name was Kelly. But he was holding her hand. And then, as I watched horrified from the sidelines, he got down on one knee and put a ring on her finger. I was so shocked. This, this must be a mistake. Carson had just proposed to me. Was this a joke? It had to be a joke, right? So I walk over, head held high, magazines under my arm, and I tap him on the shoulder. He turns around and I ask him what he's doing proposing to this other girl when he and I are clearly already engaged. I show him the magazines and that I was wearing my ring and I said I was ready to start planning the wedding if he was. And then he said words that I'll never forget. <laughs> Sorry, but you were just practice for the girl I really like. I don't exactly remember punching him in the nose, or how he ended up wrestling in the dirt. No, the details are a little fuzzy. What I do know is that it was not a regular wrestling, and it ended up with me sitting in the school office listening to the raised voices behind the vice principal's door as they told my parents what happened. Carson had a bloody nose, and I was suspended for two days. I remember walking home behind my parents my head bowed in a stance I often took when I knew I was in trouble. My family called it my piglet walk. It's kind of like this. Cue the Charlie Brown music, am I right? Anyway, we got home and I was sent to my room. I sat there, defeated. Carson's words ringing in my ears. It wasn't long, though, before Mom came in. She sat down next to me, crouching down to snuggle in under the low-hanging slats of my bottom bunk. And we just sat there for a few minutes as I quietly cried. She didn't scold me. Didn't tell me I was in trouble for practically beating up a boy. She just sat with me. And then when I was done crying, she wiped my dirty, tear-stained face, took my hand, and led me to the tub. She drew me a bath and very methodically undressed me, removing the torn shorts and once bright yellow t-shirt now stained with brown splotches, got me into the bath and hummed as she washed my hair, scooping the hot water over my head. I lied back with my ears underwater and just listened to her hum. It was one of my favorite things, listening to her sing. She always sang the same song to me in the tub, but only when I was underwater. And she'd sing, floating, floating, Ruby is floating, 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 Ruby is floating. She had this lilting voice like Mary Poppins. And when she sang, I really did feel like I was floating, like the world disappeared and it was just her and I. After the bath, she took my clothes to be washed, to be cleansed of the hurt their battled state reflected, and sent me to my room to put on my PJs. When I went to change, when I went to change, I, I realized I still had the ring on, the little shimmering red plastic stone glinting at me mockingly. And yet, for all the hurt it represented, I couldn't throw it away. Even then, I knew it had a story. A lesson. Protect your heart. Be careful who you give it to. So, I took it and put it in a tiny porcelain- I took it and put it in a small box with the rest of my treasures, which, at the time, consisted of two small purple rubber rats, a tiny porcelain bear I'd found in the playground, some holographic stickers, and a crayon drawing of a horse from my best friend at the time, Nellie. 
I haven't thought about her in a while. <laughs> Um, anyway, uh, over time, the treasures changed, but that ring stayed, and I carried it, and the lessons it taught me everywhere. Whenever I started to crush on someone, I'd picture that silly red cereal box ring sparkling with its false promises, and I'd guard my fragile little heart a bit more closely. I carried it th through all my big missteps in love, big or small. <laughs> I carried it through Carson, through Nellie. Through James, through Henry, and through... I carried it through losing Mom. It wasn't long after that incident that she got sick. The boys became the least of my worries. Instead, it was doctor's offices and hospital visits, quiet nights at home with the family curled up all around her watching Star Trek while she recovered from surgery. It was learning how to make lunches for ourselves, how to cook when she couldn't. It was focusing on her good days when she could laugh easily and you almost forgot about the sickness. It was long nights with babysitters when she and dad had to rush to the hospital. It was bringing her soup in bed after procedures. It was learning how to do the laundry on our own because she couldn't make it down the stairs anymore. It was holding her hand when she left. Three years of ups and downs, flip-flops and tumbles, broken hearts, and painful realities. After she was gone, the world was a bit more empty. I was a bit more empty. It would be a long time before I opened up myself to let anyone in. B but you know, it, it actually was Nellie who woke me up and helped me open my heart a little more again. We were 16, the perfect age for rebellion and a summer of curiosity. Thank you so much. Uh, I hope you uh, enjoyed the, sh the read so far. Um, and uh, if you're still sticking around, you know, kudos to you. It's almost half an hour of content. So thank you so much. And uh, I thank you again to Camille and to all the other artists who have made this happen impossible. And to you, if you're wondering whether or not you should sit down and start writing or start, you know, cultivating that thing that you've been thinking about or, um, you know, painting that painting you've been dreaming of doing, signing up for that improv class you've never done, just do it. Even if it's not perfect, it's something. And that something can turn into something pretty great. So thank you and uh, stay safe, friends. <laughs>